welcome to be here with you tonight. We thank you for tuning in with us as we come to share in the word of the Lord with us here at God's House Church in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Truly, it is the day that the Lord has made, and we're rejoicing, and we're glad therein. Today, I'm just thankful and grateful that I was woke up this morning, started on my way with a praise in my spirit and the joy bells ringing in my soul. Today is a, just an awesome day that God has allowed me to see, and I don't know about you, but I'm rejoicing, I'm magnifying, I'm praising just for the, another opportunity to be in the land of the living. For we all know that many laid down last night. They did not awake this morning. But for those of us that are awoke in our right minds, having uh, the breath running through our bodies, blood running through our veins, we ought to be magnifying and celebrating the God of our salvation. And we ought to just give him praise, honor, and glory. Because truly he didn't have to do it, but he did. And I just thank you all for being with us tonight. Tonight we're going to go into the word of the Lord uh, in the book of Genesis. Going back into chapter number three, there's some profound truths that the Lord has revealed there in the word of the Lord. We just want to share a few things with you. But before we go into the word and as you grab your Bibles, I'm just going to say a quick word of prayer. Most kind, gracious fathers, we've come tonight. We're giving you thanks. We're giving you honor. We're giving you glory for another time and season that you've allowed us to share and partake in the blessings of your word. We bless you tonight, O oh God, for those that are with us tonight. Let the word of the Lord minister to their spirits and cause them to seek you in another plane, another dimension, another realm of relationship and fellowship. Now, Father, I pray tonight that you would bless the the desires upon the hearts of your people. For you know, O oh God, all that we're dealing with right now. You're the author and the finisher of our faith, and we thank you for it. And we blessing you in advance for ministering and meeting us at the point of contact of our needs. Father, we just thank you today for healing virtue, for your power and the honor and glory that only you rightly deserve. Now bless us tonight to speak, dispense, and disseminate your word, and bless the hearers of your word to not only be hearers, but to be doers of your word. And Father, Father, we just thank you, we bless you, and we glorify and magnify you in the precious and mighty name of Jesus, the only name under heaven in which man can be saved. We thank you right now in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Truly tonight, if you would, open your Bibles to the third chapter of the book of Genesis. It's here, the word of the Lord has given us something to speak and minister unto the people of God tonight. I'm just excited about what he's dropped into my spirit. And I hope tonight that we'll say something that will help you go a, a step higher in your walk and your relationship and your fellowship with him. Here the Bible lets us know in Genesis chapter 3, just verse number 7. It said, and the eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God calling in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam said, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told thee that thou was naked and hast thou eaten of the tree thereof? I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat. And the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. Here in chapter number three, as we were in last week, dealing with own it from the series we've been, the Lord dropped in my spirit about dealing with the pain from other people's decisions. Last week we were dealing with this chapter, chapter number three. There's some profound truths that you see here in this chapter. Anybody that knows the biblical scholars out there, the first five chapters of the book of Genesis give all the doctrines and revelations that the Bible proceeds after the first five chapters of, Gen of Genesis. It's here in this chapter, though, we see some profound truths that God lets us see early on. One of the first things we see here that caught my attention is the headship that God had put upon man 
It's man's responsibility to be the head, the protector, the covering, but also the instructor of what God has given man to say and to do. Here we see in this chapter, here in this early part of the chapter, that it was Adam's responsibility to teach Eve that which the Lord had spoken unto him. Adam taught her, but he did not fully do his job uh, dutifully, if you will, to the degree and to the point that he spoke correctly, distinctly, clearly what God had spoken unto him. And this, as we see in this chapter, uh, let the door be open for the serpent, the devil, to get in and begin to trick and deceive Eve from the standpoint that the words that she spoke out of her own mouth, that she said her husband spoke unto her, uh, we see here that it was used against her. We see here in this chapter, it shows us something about the power of the enemy. Satan is a cruel character. That fellow is shrewd. He's cunning. He's conniving. You know, that one-eyed, no good, uh, long-toed fellow, he's something else because you see here something about him, how he will take a half-truth and get the people of God to do what they shouldn't do, but because he appeals and uses the appeal of the flesh to get us to do some things that we know we're not supposed to do, but because he brings it to the point that it brings gratification and satisfaction to the flesh, it causes man to go against what God had spoken unto him. Because we've seen in the early part of this chapter here how he presented that tree of the knowledge of good and evil unto Eve as something that was nothing bad, that it was not what God intended that when they would uh, touch it and they could not eat of it, that their eyes would be open. He gave them a half truth. Yes, their eyes was going to be open. But what you found out in this about the devil is the devil in his shrewdness, he will tell you what you want to hear, giving you a half truth but it's not the full truth and it causes you to go contrary to what God had spoken to what he's given unto you, causing man to fall. We see here that Eve here, uh, she took of the fruit, she ate it, she was deceived, but then she gives it to Adam who transgressed and the Bible lets us see that while he was there, he had the opportunity and the privilege to say no. And as I thought about that and contemplated about that, it let me see something about how with man we'll be given the ability to have free will. Free will is what the ability of man to uh, have the ability to choose about the decisions that they're going to make. And you have that ability and no one can hinder or stop you but you, if you will. And what I like about free will is in the fact that God allows man to make decisions even though he knows the impact that's going to happen, but we have to learn for ourselves. Adam made a conscientious decision to override, overstep what the spoken known word of God was unto him fully, clearly, and distinctly. And he goes against it and uses his free will to partake of that which God told him not to. But what the devil does not let you know a lot of the times, many of the times, if not all the times, is that when you make some decisions contrary to the word of the Lord, there are consequences that follow. And many of times where we get suckered in is we only see the benefit, the blessing that it's going to bring to the flesh of, of us as individuals, but we don't understand or realize that there is pain that's going to come following the decisions that we make. And Many times we as people, when we make decisions, we're making them, as I stated last week, at a moment in time, a period in time, where we're thinking this decision that I'm about to make is the best decision at this point in time that I can make. And many a times that's true. But there are many times where we make decisions that we have contemplated. We have time to think. We have time to explore the, the ramifications of our actions of the decisions that we're about to make. And sometimes we still make a decision that will be pleasing to the flesh. Also, what happens as a spirit-filled, born-again believer, sometimes the decisions we're about to make, sometimes the Holy Ghost will speak to us and give us in that small, still voice a, a warning sign that, hey, you may not want to do that. This may happen if you do, but what happens is because of the freedom of choice and our free will, we override the Spirit of God and we do what we want to do. Here, Adam and Eve now have opened up a door. 
For the Bible says, the eyes of them both were open. And you look back in verse number five, the Satan, the serpent spoke to them and said, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open. It was true what he stated. Their eyes were open, but their eyes were open to a fact of something that they were not prepared to understand or realize is now by partaking of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now what they have done is they've opened the door and they've stepped into a realm that they were not prepared for because now what they've done is they've ushered in sin that was never there and that never was intended for man to partake of. But because of their freedom of choice because Adam willfully knowingly went against what God had spoken sin now has been ushered in and now we all of mankind from Adam on down we are now under the penalty of sin but because Jesus Christ came and now that we have the ability to be a born again rejuvenated re b b believer we do not have to suffer the penalties of sin but here Adam and Eve now because of their actions they're going to suffer some things you know and you see here the eyes were open and they covered themselves the Bible lets us know with fig leaves that they sewed together and they made aprons. Here we see something about sin. When sin is entered in, it brings about something that we as believers and people don't really fully understand. I grew up and I heard the saying that sin will cost you more than you want to pay. Sin will take you further than you want to go. And sin, um, it was something in our, for the believer that it will challenge you and make you do things that you really ordinarily shouldn't do. But here we see something about Adam and Eve now that sin has come in. It's ushered in a spirit now that they were not used to. It brought in guilt, it brought in shame, and it's brought in fear. And you think about we as believers. I thought about myself, speaking for myself only, but you under the sound of my voice viewing tonight, you can attest to this too. When each and every one of us, when we have fallen into a place of sin, the first thing that happens after we commit the sin is we're hit with the spirit of guilt upon us. Sometimes that guilt is so strong. Sometimes that guilt, uh, it causes you just to weep. It causes you to mourn. You don't get any peace. You don't have any joy. And this is what the devil did to them in the Garden of Eden. The peaceful serenity and the, the, of the Garden of Eden was now corrupted because sin has now entered in and now the habitation that God had prepared for his children now was now messed up all because sin had entered in through Adam and Eve. But the devil didn't allow them to understand that to let them know that if you did this, this is what's going to happen. But all they saw was the benefits that it was going to do to the flesh. The, I, the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes. But here we see the Adam and Eve now falling under guilt to the degree and the point that they had to cover themselves. Their purity that the light had provided for them was now taken away because the darkness of sin had entered in and now Adam and Eve were uncovered and what God never intended for them to realize or see now they're walking in what they did experientially and experimentally now they academically weren't were are now learn, learning about sin in a way in a manner that God never intended for them to know and now because of this now they're uncovered what God God never wanted them to be uncovered. They were covered by the blood, the purity of the light of Jesus Christ. But now sin has entered in and that darkness has brought in a divide, a separation that sin has caused. And we all know about the, the sin, that how it separates man from his relationship with God. Now because of the sins of Adam, all mankind, until we are born again, are regenerated believers, we are separated from relationship, separated from fellowship, separated from the harmony that God intended for man to have because man was the only animal that God created, the only creation that God created that he gave freedom of will to because he wanted us to willfully 
obey him, willfully trust him, willfully love him. All the other creatures and all the other creations, they don't have a choice like man has. But God gave man something special, something different to show just how much he loved and adored us. But Adam and Eve allowed that serpent, that w his willingness and his wittiness to get man separated from the love of God. All because in the Garden of Eden, the devil had a, a plan that he wanted to be like God as we all knew up in heaven. But he wanted man not to have that relationship that God intended for man to have. And so now Adam and Eve here have now uncovered something that was not for them to originally have. So guilt has set in. The guilt so strong on them that they had to do something because their bodies, the nakedness was now exposed that they never knew nothing about. The shame factor has kicked in. And we're going to later on, we're going to see how fear kicks in. Because sin will bring about these three dimensions in the life of a sinful individual. And the Bible says here in verse number 8, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. When I read this, and when you read this, it begins really just to let me see just the place, the fellowship, the relationship that Adam and Eve shared with God. Think about it. We have the same ability to have our daily relationship where God meets us in our prayer time, where God will meet us uh, at that season of prayer and that time where we set aside for fellowship with him. Here, Adam and Eve, in the cool of the day, in the evening time, if they will, after they had did the responsibility of Adam that he had in taking care of the garden, God had set up a set time for them to meet where God would have fellowship, communion, and relationship with them and here now he's looking for them in the garden and the Bible says here that in the cool of the day Adam and Eve hid themselves why did they hide themselves because they knew that they were not where they should be they knew that they had now have gotten severed that relationship and that fellowship with Christ because they did the thing that God told them not to do which was partake of the fruit on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil he had let them know that if you did it you were going to surely die but what they did not fully understand nor comprehend was the type of death that was going to take place Place. They may have been thinking that it could have been a straight physical death, but it was a slow death, a death that caused them to have a disbanded relationship and fellowship with Christ. And because of that, mankind today, until we, as I stated once before, until we have that relationship restored back through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the spirit of the Holy Ghost, mankind cannot establish that relationship and fellowship that Adam and Eve had before the fall. But here they hide themselves from the presence of the Lord in the trees in the midst of the garden. And I begin to think about that. And I wonder if you all have thought about it sometimes in your leisure time, just what Adam and Eve gave up. Think about having God meet you daily in the garden in the cool of the day where you can have fellowship you can have relationship with him we can have that fellowship and relationship now but I thought about it from Adam and Eve's point here was God meeting them coming to them we come to God and he shows up to us sometime God will speak and quicken us to get up to speak to him he'll come to us as well but I thought about it from the standpoint Adam and Eve had that relationship with him to the degree to the point where every day at the set time Time. They were able to have fellowship and communion with God. They could speak to him. They can talk to him. They can hear him speak to them. They can glean from the wisdom and knowledge that he was sharing and giving unto them. But now because sin has entered in and sin when it comes in, it is just a, it's a terrible thing that they experience now because all that they had beforehand now has shifted and changed. And here they hide in themselves. You see something about the frailty of man and the thinking of man. That how do they think 
that the omniscient God, the all-seeing, the all-knowing, the all-powerful, did not, would not, could not find them. Here they're trying to hide in the trees in the place that he created for them. He knew every aspect, every inch, every centimeter, every millimeter of the Garden of Eden. But the finite thinking of man, even though God had given Adam and Eve a portion of his mind, he did not give them all his mind, but they thought that they could hide from him. It shows you that how we think as individuals, that we think of what we do, that God will not uncover our sins, that God does not know our sins, that God does not know where we're hiding when we're running. He knows it all. There's no place on heaven or earth that we can run from the presence of God. But Adam and Eve here, because sin is now entering in, in their mind, they're thinking, if I could hide myself, maybe he can't find me, maybe he won't see me. But Adam knew, he had to have known that God knew everything, and he was going to find them. But because of the guilt factor and the shame of what they had done. And now the fear has kicked in. What would be my punishment for what has happened? But God calls out to them. And, and it says here, he says in verse number nine. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? I like this because anytime we as individuals sin, God gives us the opportunity and the place and the time and the moment to repent for what we've done. He speaks to Adam and he tells, he asks Adam a simple question. Where are you? Where art thou? And verse number 10 allows us to see Adam's response. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid. He was afraid because of the fact he knew what he'd done. He had went against what God had spoken to him. But he was afraid also because he did not fully understand or know the exact punishment that was going to be measured out to him for him doing what God had told him not to do. He tells God, I was naked and I hid myself. Instead of Adam stepping up to the plate at this time and moment and accepting responsibility for the sinful act that he'd done, for the transgression of going against the spoken and known word of God that was directly given unto him, Adam now goes a, another path and makes an excuse and he does not speak to God and say, Lord, here am I. I sinned. I went against what you did. Adam now goes another way and he tries to diffuse the situation, if you will, by telling God, I was afraid because I was naked. I hid myself. It shows you something about we as individuals and mankind that when we are called on the carpet, if you will, when we are put on the front street for our sins, our indiscretions, instead of stepping up and doing what we, we should do, we sometimes hesitate. We sometimes delineate from telling the truth and we go a whole nother round trying to circumvent the situation by instead of being direct and clear in what we've done, we all go another direction. We don't tell the truth, but we try to uh, stretch it out. We try to uh, uh, come up with another solution, another uh, uh, way of thinking that we can get this situation cleared up. You know, I was thinking about how we as people, children, here the father, here's a prime example of a father and a child. The child has done something wrong. The father comes to the child. The child is given an opportunity to confess, to speak up to the misdeeds that he's done. But like all children do, instead of telling the truth, we make excuses. We'll tell another lie. And all a father is looking for is for us to admit the wrongs that we've done. His arms are going to be wide open to receive us again. But we don't take advantage of that opportunity because the, 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 the penalty or the pain of the guilt, the shame, and the fear for, for all the, the punishment that's going to come because of our actions. But here Adam now, he makes his excuse and he tells the Lord, and the Lord says unto him in verse number 11, and he said, who told thee thou was naked? God knows. He knew the situation. He knew it before it had, uh, happened that Adam was going to do this. But he gives him the opportunity to speak and to say what really happened, to confess, 
to take responsibility for his actions. But you know, we as people, we do just like our father Adam. Whenever we're called out on the carpet, whenever our sins have been exposed, instead of accepting the responsibility right away, what we do is we hide behind the guilt of what we've done, the shame and the fear, and instead of speaking and saying, I messed up, I did this, this, and so the other, we make an excuse. God asked Adam what he did. He said, hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldn't not eat? The opportunity was there. But Adam, now because sin has entered in, because of the, the guilt factor and the fear of what was going to happen, Adam says to him very distinctly and clearly, he doesn't step to the plate. He doesn't man up. He doesn't own up to the action of what he did. But Adam in verse number 12 says, The woman thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. Here you see something about Adam. His wit was sharp and quick in reflecting and throwing off on his actions. But he first puts it on God. Because he says, the woman you gave me. The woman that God gave Adam. But if you go back into chapter number two, you see something there when you begin to read that when God created Adam and then when he put him in the garden, you see also that when he made the animals and gave Adam the responsibility of the garden and the animals, Adam began to see the animals had companionship, they had relationship, they had somebody to speak to with and talk with in the, in the animal kingdom, but he was all alone. God recognized and realized that Adam had a desire for companionship and relationship. Even though he had that with him, Adam wanted somebody he could physically touch, physically be with. And so God knew the heart and the spirit and the mind of Adam. So he gave Adam what Adam desired. But here we see Adam now throws it back and says, it was you, this woman you gave me. Failing to recognize and realize that it was desire upon your heart, seeing the animal kingdom, each animal male had some companionship. But here the man that God created had no companionship, but now God creates the woman out of the rib of Adam. He brings into Adam. Adam calls her woman. And now they have the first marriage. We see man and woman giving us the sign that uh, what's going on in the world today is not acceptable. It's not what God intended. It's against what God has put in place for man. Man is to be married to woman and to woman only. Woman to man and to man only. But in our society till we day, we got man marrying man, women marrying women, which is contrary to the word of God. But Adam now throws it back on God. He throws, if you will, God first under the bus by saying, it's your fault. You gave me this woman. But then he throws Eve under the bus. He said, the woman that thou gavest me gave me of the tree and I did eat. Instead of taking his responsibility and owning up, this is what we in society have to do. Especially we as believers. When we commit a sin, when we do a wrong. We have to own up to what we've done. We have to confess first and foremost to God the sin that we've done. And if we've done a sin unto someone else, where we've caused them pain, where we've caused them hurt, where we've caused them turmoil, we caused them distress, we need to go to that individual as well and ask for forgiveness of what we've done to them. But what we really do many a times is the first thing we want to do is we want to throw somebody else under the bus, not accept the responsibility for the actions we've committed. And I thought about this today. From the inception of man in the Garden of Eden, we have been throwing individuals up under the bus for the actions of things we've done willfully and knowingly. We won't take the responsibility. It's through though for a born against believer, the thing I love the most is the Holy Ghost will prick your heart and convict you when you know you've done wrong. And what I like about how God does it is in a still small voice, he'll speak to you in the midnight hour when you're trying to rest, when you're trying to sleep. God will touch you and say, you know you were wrong. 
you know you need to go back to brother so-and-so and sister cucumber and you need to tell them that, you know, I'm sorry for the acts and things I've done. Many a times we have husbands, when we speak harshly to our wives, sometimes the Spirit of the Lord will prick our hearts and the pride of man sometimes will rise up. And I know speaking for myself and myself only, sometimes you'll say, Shh, I ain't going to go back. You know, I know I was right. But sometimes the way that we said it, we could have been right in what we said, but the words came out the wrong way and we were harsh in the way we said it and not in a loving, kind, gentle manner. Because when God deals with us, most of the time. He deals with us in a loving, kind, gentle manner. And then there are times and moments where he will deal with us harshly when we need that. But sometimes we have to, as men, when we've done something wrong, we have to go back and we have to apologize. We have to repent. We have to ask for forgiveness. Here, Adam, instead of asking for forgiveness and telling, Lord, I'm sorry, he throws it back on God that it's this woman you gave me. He throws Eve up under the bus that the woman you gave me, she gave me this fruit and I did eat it. He threw her up under the bus instead of taking responsibility. And in our society today, this is where in our political landscape, no one wants to take responsibility for what is going on. Everybody wants to pass the buck. Nobody wants to take responsibility for what happened. Everybody wants to throw the blame here or throw the blame there. But those that are in positions of authority, if we're wrong, we have to take responsibility for our actions. The headship was given to man. Man has to take responsibility for the actions that he displays for the things he does verbally and actionally. We have to take responsibility. Adam lets us see here something, the frailty and the, of a man is we will not take the responsibility of our actions. We have to own it. We as people have to own our mistakes. We have to own our failures because we and we alone made those decisions and those decisions come with consequences. Adam and Eve at this point realize now the consequence of a decision that they make. But I wondered as they were here at this time and moment in the Garden of Eden afterwards, when they were even hiding themselves, did the thought ever cross their mind that we messed up? We're going to have to own up to what we did. Many a times we try to circumvent it. We try to run from it. We try to say, oh, it's going to smooth itself over. Oh, they know, understand, and they know. But when you have done something, somebody wrong, when you have committed a sin, you, you alone have to atone for what you've done. You, you alone have to ask God for repentance. You, you alone have to be godly sorrowful for what you've done. And if you've done it to someone, you have to go back to that person with a repentant heart asking for forgiveness. It's not that if they don't forgive you, if they don't acknowledge what you've done, you've cleared your conscience and you've done what was right in the eyesight of God. Now God will deal with that individual concerning their response to your asking for forgiveness. But here what we see here is Adam. Adam here does not want to own up to what he's done. He wants to pass the book over to Eve. Eve as we know, was deceived. But Adam transgressed. He went over what God spoke to him. And, and that really just, it brings something to my spirit when I begin to think about it. Because we do this just as well. When we sin and we go against what God has spoken in his word, we do the same thing that Adam did. We are willfully transgressing over the spoken and the written known word of God because we value our fleshly activity and our fleshly satisfaction and our fleshly gratification more than fulfilling and walking up under the precepts and the word of God. And it's a terrible thing when we as individuals Overlook what God has spoken. Think about it. Each and every one of us have went over what God has told us to do. 
He lets us know we shouldn't lie. We shouldn't steal. Some of us have killed folks. We may not have killed them with a gun, with a knife, with a brick, a stick, or running over them with a car, but we have killed them maybe with our words or our actions. We've done things contrary to the word of God. We've stepped over things. We've committed sins willfully and knowingly. We've also committed sins unwillfully and unknowingly. But in all that, we still have to ask for forgiveness. But what we do, we are like Adam. Instead of owning it, instead of taking the responsibility for actions. Well, Lord, if they hadn't have done this, this wouldn't have happened. If they hadn't spoke to me in the manner they did. Now, who do they think they are? You know, oh, my name is Damon Shelby. I'm seven times three. You know, I'm the oldest child of Bishop Michael and Charlotte Shepard. Don't nobody talk to me like that. And we're going to give them, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. But in doing that, we went against what God has spoken. But instead of me saying, Lord, forgive me, I'm wrong. And going to that person, I want to pass the book. And many times we as believers, we're good at doing this. Many of the things that happen in the church of God is all because of many folk won't go back and apologize and ask for forgiveness for the sins they committed. You know, and then we want to hold grudges. And then we want to hold unforgiveness in our heart. We got to let that go. You got to own your responsibility. But the things that people have done for you and to you, all you can do is put them in the hands of God and let God deal with them. He's the one that has the power to deal with the individual. But here, Adam, instead of taking the responsibility and owning up to it, he throws Eve up under the bus. And what I like about this here is because of the headship role that Adam plays. He is the protector. He is the provider. And he also is the covering. But he is the instructor. It was his role to teach the precepts and the ordinances and the oracles that God had given to him, to Eve, and to the household. But I see something here in verse number 13. It says here, it shows you what Eve did in response to what Adam did. She says, it says here, and the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. Now what Eve does is she did the same thing that Adam did. But she throws, not Adam, not God under the bus, but she throws the serpent under the bus. But all she's doing here is what was given to her by her husband. She's now telling God the same thing. The instruction that God gave Adam, she's now throwing the devil, the serpent, under the bus because that's the instruction she saw and heard from her husband. That when God confronts you about your sins, your activities, you throw somebody up under the bus, so she throws the devil up under the bus. But what I like about it here is you see something about the spirit of Eve. Eve says, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. She takes responsibility after she says, she says she did eat. There is something there within the heart of Eve to let her know that she was wrong. She was, yes, the serpent got me, but I did eat. She owned up to it. Adam had the chance to own up to his, but it took him a while. It took him a moment, but Eve immediately opens up. But now you see, because of this, the consequences, as you read on or over, uh, over in chapter number three down, you see the penalties and the consequences of sin. What the enemy does to us is he allows us to see the pleasures and the satisfaction of sin, but he never brings to you the consequences and the penalty that there follow if you fall into sin. He glamorizes it. He paints a pretty picture and it looks good. And for those of us who have fallen into the traps of the enemy, remember, he's sharp. He's cunning. 
He is clever. He is smooth. He's been at this game for over 6,000 years. The same game he ran on Adam and Eve in the garden is the same game he's running on us today. But the thing about it is, is we as believers, we have reference. We have the word of God. We have the spirit of God within us that we have the ability, just as Adam and Eve, to overcome it. We have reference to where when he begins to bring to us the pride of life, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, we can say, whoa, now, this is what you did to Adam and Eve. I'm not going to fall for the same trip. But because the satisfaction it brings, because the pleasure it brings, and because the contemplation that we take as we contemplate what he's getting us and wanting us to do, instead of us immediately, as Adam and Eve should have done, immediately saying, Satan, get behind me, or saying, the Lord has said not to do this, we entertain that thought. And then the next thing that happens, we're drawn away by our own lust, our own lustful desires, and then we fall into sin, and then what do we do? The same thing, we want to blame the enemy, the devil, for what we've done. Many a times the devil has been given, uh, dealt the wrong hand. Because some things the devil didn't make us do. He cannot make man do anything. The devil can present it, he can glamorize it, but he cannot make you commit the act of sin and walking into the trap that he set that caused you to sin. You made a willful decision a choice to do what you've done. All of us have done that. And so we got to take ownership in the fact the devil presented it, but the devil cannot make man do anything. All he can do is present it to you, but you, man, me, you, all of us, when we fall contrary to the word of God and fall into sinful acts and activities, we made a willful choice and decision to do that sin. And what we have to do after fact is when the spirit convicts us, when the shame, the guilt, and the fear come in, we have to accept it and ask God for forgiveness and, and, and tell God, Lord, I'm sorry for what I've done. Help me to overcome it. And in that, you also have to walk now in the wisdom and knowledge that when you've asked God for forgiveness of the sins you've committed, you cannot allow the enemy to keep throwing it back up in your face. You cannot allow people to bring back up to what you've done because once you've asked God for forgiveness of the sins you've committed that you've owned up to, he throws it into the sea of forgiveness. But what happens is, is we as individuals, we still walk around under that condemnation, under that mindset of the sin, that we've done. But baby, let me tell you, when God has, when you've asked God for forgiveness and God has accepted your forgiveness, what you have to do is throw it out as well. And when the devil tries to bring it back, uh, he's forgiven me. I've forgiven myself. Now Satan, you get behind me because I'm going forward under the power and the anointing of Jesus Christ. But the devil does not allow you to see the consequences I say in my mind, if Adam and Eve had had a full understanding and revelation of the consequence of sin, they would have never partaken of that fruit off of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But because it appealed to them, stimulated them in a satisfactory way, they overstepped what God, Adam did, what God told him to do, and they walked into now what God never intended for them to experiences with the consequences of their sinful actions. As you read on later into the chapter, mankind suffered tremendously through this. Women, childbirth became painful. The Bible also let us know that now women would be subjected to the rule of the husband where God now, the woman, you see it, I understand it clearly, you know, that when a woman has a child by a man now, 
He's given them something that no other man has given them. And they just cling to that man. No matter how good, no matter how bad. But it's the fulfillment of the word. Man was given the punishment of having to work by the sweat of his brow. When God gave man a managerial position in the Garden of Eden, he was a manager. He was a supervisor. He just had to make sure the garden was taken care of. But now he had to go from a desk job, if you will, to now manual labor. He had to sweat by his brow because of the penalty of sin. It's a terrible thing when we don't adhere to the warnings of the Holy Spirit. Those of you tonight, we got to own our decisions. But when God speaks to you clearly and distinctly regarding the steps you're about to take, you can't blame nobody but yourself if you override what he's speaking. It looks good. It's appealing to the flesh. But the end thereof is destruction. The end thereof is doom, gloom, despair. And what it does is it separates you from the relationship that God intends for man to have. But tonight, we got to own it. Because only you and you alone made that decision. You can't throw somebody else under the bus. We as children of God and people in general, we're good for throwing people under the bus. I got a five-year-old grand, a six-year-old grandson and a five-year-old granddaughter whose birthday is the day. And I watch it in amazement how the scriptures come alive before my very eyes with my grandson and my granddaughter when they get caught in the acts of, of the things they're doing that they have been taught and told not to do. And when you question them, the first thing my grandson will say, I didn't do it, Monty did it. Or my granddaughter, I didn't do it, Bubba did it. Neither one of them will take responsibility for their own actions. They're going to throw each other under the bus. And it just brings to my mind and it brings a chuckle to my spirit. I said, wow, this is what Adam and Eve did in the garden. And I said to myself, wow, my response is probably like God's response. He knew beforehand, before the foundation of the world, what they were going to do. But he gave them the freedom of choice. And instead of owning up to the decisions that they made and they chose, they decided to throw each other up under the bus. But the onus is on Adam because the responsibility was given unto him. And it was his responsibility. Even though Eve did what she did, Adam had the responsibility to go by what God spoke to him directly. Adam also had the responsibility to speak clearly and distinctly what God spoke to him to Eve. He failed in that aspect, but he did not have to fall in succumbing to the pressure, if you will, of what Eve asking him to partake of that fruit. He could have looked at her and said, baby, I love you, but I'm not going to do what you've done because God spoke to me. I love God more than I love you. And that's where we have to be in the place in the position that I love God more than fulfilling the desires of my flesh. That I love him and worship him more than allowing the enemy to trick and deceive me with something that's only going to be temporary satisfaction, but I can fall into permanent destruction and doom and gloom. But tonight, I implore you to own it. And in the decisions that you make, you got to realize and understand as Adam and Eve, the decisions you make, there are consequences, there are penalties, but it also causes pain to somebody else. And I say to myself, if Adam had known the pain that he caused first himself, but first and foremost God, then himself, and then Eve, would he have done what he did? But because we don't know the consequences of our decisions, we make a decision at a point in time. 
But I'm so thankful and grateful that the Holy Ghost that that abides and resides in me and also in you speaks to us and gives us a clear warning when we should not make a decision, when we should not make a move. But it's up to us to adhere to the Spirit of God. Because one thing God will not do, he will not override the decisions that you want to make because your free will, your ability to make a decision is unimpeded by God. Father, tonight we want to thank you and bless you for the word that you've given unto us. I pray tonight that this has been an encouragement and a strengthening to your people. That in the process of making decisions, that we will seek first thee in making that decision. And as you speak, even though that decision may be contrary to what our fleshly desires may be, that we will allow your spirit to override what we want to do. That we will allow your spirit to have more preeminence than our flesh. And that we will walk in accordance to what you're speaking so that we will avoid the pitfall and the pain that decisions we will make. Father, I thank you for those that have tuned in tonight. I pray that you would bless them. I pray that the rest of their week will be glorious and magnificent and that you will show your hand mightily upon them in their lives. And we thank you tonight in the precious and mighty name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen and amen. Also tonight we want to thank every one of you that have tuned in and watched us. Write to us. We've been getting letters. We've been getting phone calls. It's been an encouragement to let us know that what the Lord has been giving unto us to speak to you on our Wednesday uh, midweek services and on our Sunday worship and services that the Lord has given us words to encourage and bless your lives. Also, we want you to sow tonight into the ministry. Go to our website to give the five up there in our website. You can go to, to God's House Church and there in the upper right hand corner, give Lafay on the website. You can sow a cash app at dollar signs, God's House Church. And we also have PayPal where you can give. Give in these three areas and watch God move tremendously and mightily in your life. This is the time that we as believers can let God see just how much we trust him. And what I can tell you from experience, when you trust God and you step out on the spoken, written word of God, you cannot not receive a blessing. The Bible lets us know that when we sow and we give, he's going to open up the windows of heaven and pour out to us a blessing that we have room enough to not receive. But what the devil does in this time and season, yes, you're at home. Yes, your paychecks may not be to the degree that they were before corona hit. The coronavirus hit the land. But what God is letting you see and what God is wanting to you to see is just if you trust me, just if you try me, if you approve me, he's going to show you how magnificently he wants to bless you. And this is the time and season. This is also the time and season where God's doing great things in the lives of believers, not only from a giving standpoint, but through your giving, he will bless you and giving you a return back but he will expand your health. He will protect your families in greater dimensions and ways. He will keep you from danger seen and unseen because the faithfulness of your giving will shower down blessings upon you in dimensions and ways that we never thought about. But so here at God's House Church, write to us, God's House Church, 2335 Wyoming Boulevard Northeast, Albuquerque, New Mexico, 87112. For those of you who don't want to go to the GiveLify, the PayPal, or the Cash App, you can write your checks or give money orders to God's House Church. It goes to a secure mailbox that we have at our P.O. Post Office box, and if we will get it, no one will bother it. Your giving will be secure and safe. But we just want to thank you. We want to bless you, and we celebrate you for tuning in with us tonight. Tune again in with us this coming Sunday as well, where you will hear a word from the Lord. From here at God's House Church, the place where everybody is somebody, the place where Jesus Christ is Lord of us all, and we 
just want to thank you for tuning us in with us tonight here at God's House Church. Blessings to you and to your families. Be safe, be careful, but also be not fearful. And also tonight, we want to thank you right now and welcome you to tune in with us this coming Sunday at 11 a.m. here at God's House Church where there will be singing, there will be preaching, where praise, glory, where the word of the Lord will come forth and will bless your soul. But tune in again with us this coming Sunday at 11 a.m. where you will hear a word from heaven that will strengthen, enrich, and magnify our God of our salvation with us here at God's House Church. Thank you and we look forward to seeing you and being with you today with us.